A1 and A3 chemistry. You have a test coming up and I thought it would be helpful if I made you a video uh, to help you study and let you know what was going to be on the test. So if you remember back at the beginning of the school year, uh, you learned about scientific equipment and the names of different types of equipment that we would uh, use during the school year and that you're likely to use um, in biology uh, next year or in college. So just like on the homework and the quizlet that I made you and uh, the two quizzes that you've had, uh, there are um, particular instruments used in chemistry that will definitely be on the test and then there are some that are lesser known that will also could be on the test. So I have my own science equipment at home and as you know I do collect um, real tiny science um, laboratory equipment. So this is a real five milliliter beaker. This is not a toy. I actually use this in my bioengineering class when we only need three milliliters um, of one of our cross linkers. So if you take that with me, you will get to use that. But this is a beaker. Everybody pretty much knows what a beaker is. Um, this is a mortar and pestle. So it's a tiny mortar and pestle, um, but a mortar and pestle nonetheless. This is used uh, to crush solids into powders. And this is a volumetric flask. So I, I collect uh, tiny science equipment and I also have started collecting uh, the red uh, scientific equipment. So this is a red volumetric flask. They have a line on them and then they have a volume written on them. And this type of flask is used to measure 100 milliliters exactly. Uh, and that is its only job in this world. If you need 100 milliliters exactly, you use a volumetric flask. It may seem like I may not have that uh, need in my life, but that's fine because really these are used, um, probably the way that you'll use them if you ever use one, uh, is to make a solution. And when you make a solution, you usually are trying to make a target endpoint volume. So if you want to make a um, 100 mils of a 20% SDS solution, then you would want to use a volumetric flask uh, so that the final volume is 100 milliliters. Uh, and this is an Erlenmeyer flask. Once again, um, I have started collecting these red uh, versions of the glassware. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an Erlenmeyer flask, a red one, uh, and this is a tiny Erlenmeyer flask. It's precious, right? Uh, it's five mils and it is a real deal Erlenmeyer flask and also precious. Um, if I can find a red five mil Erlenmeyer flask, watch out. I would be, I would be the happiest person on the planet. Um, one thing I am really, really looking for is a one, they make a one milliliter uh, beaker. I know they exist because when I was in college, I was a chemistry major and I did uh, research with Dr. Laura Wright and in her supply closet is where I saw the very first ever one mil beaker. And I didn't steal it because I was good and honest and I should have taken it. I did not know, no, I should not have taken it, but I did not realize how hard they are to find. I cannot find one anywhere. So I'm always checking to see if I can find one. And I do feel good about myself that I did not steal because I'm still friends with Dr. Ray, but anyhow, it would be wrong even if I wasn't still friends with her. You know what a funnel is? We, you used funnels outside of chemistry before. Uh, graduated cylinders, uh, once again, you are very uh, used to seeing graduated cylinders. That's not something strange to you. And then um, test tubes also are fairly well known, even if you've never had a chemistry class before. Uh, and then also, I did that in break. Uh, so this is a test tube rack. They come in all shapes and sizes. 
you may ask, well, where is your tiny test tube rack? And then I would say to you that I actually found one on eBay and I ordered it. So I'll let you see that as soon as I get it. So this is a wooden uh, test tube rack with glass test tubes in it. Test tubes come plastic, all, uh, there's even self-standing uh, test tubes. Uh, and this is a glass pipetter with a pipetting bulb on the end. Uh, there's all kinds of different pipetters. This is a glass pipette. This is a disposable plastic pipette. And I do have tiny plastic disposable pipettes as well. Uh, and then there are micro pipetters, which you'll use in biology. But the reason you would use one or the other, the glass are usually used with organic solvents because if you use plastic, it would eat the solvent. So these are typically used in organic chemistry. Um, and so those are all of the pipe headers. Now, a lesser known piece of equipment uh, is the tripod. Uh, and then the tripod actually is used for heating up um, some kind of solution. Uh, you, the uh, wire square with the ceramic center, and that's the name, not very, um, don't, mm. yep, Luna, Luna, leave it alone. I dropped one of the test tubes at another time. Hey, baby, come make a cameo appearance. Come and look me, you look this. So maybe chemistry can be a little boring, but look at this little pumpkin. Are you a pumpkin? Okay, she loves her dresses. You don't need to worry about it. So if you put a Bunsen burner or even an oil lamp under here, uh, then you can put your larger beaker on top, and then you can heat up the liquid. Uh, you can put a... Um, evaporation disk, all kinds of things. If, if you need to heat something up and you're going to use a flame, then you would use the tripod. Uh, a heating plate looks like a balance, except it has a, um, an electrical element on the inside so that it heats things up. And this is a tripod. And I mean, this is not a tripod. This is, this is not a tripod. This was the tripod and um, this can be called an O-ring stand, um, and that's because usually uh, you'll encounter them with the O-ring here uh, that is used to hold things like this separation funnel. You don't have to know the separation funnel. Uh, this you'll use in organic uh, chemistry, but you do need to know the burette. Uh, the burette you won't use unless um, you take more chemistry classes, um, but you notice that they have this valve at the bottom so you can uh, allow the liquid to drain out um, in a controlled manner. So if you take AP chemistry, you'll use this uh, to do an acid-base titration. But the purpose of this burette is to um, have control over liquid as it is being mixed into another solution. So here you could just add a little bit at a time. And there are various types of clamps that you can put on the ring stand uh, to hold different types of equipment. Um, if you take organic chemistry, you'll use those uh, a lot. All right, now we're gonna switch over to Schoology uh, and then we'll go through the other uh, pieces of equipment. Hello, A1 and A3 Chemistry. This is a video that will help you review for the Unit 1 test that's coming up. On our Schoology page, the topics that will be on the test to some degree uh, are here in these different folders. And don't forget that there is an online textbook that you can use uh, for reference. It wouldn't hurt uh, to read it. It is an online textbook provided by Rice University. Uh, it's called OpenStax and they have online textbooks for a lot of different subjects 
It's a really, really good textbook. Uh, it is definitely worthwhile reading it. It has embedded uh, problems and um, simulations, videos, etc. So it is really good and worth just uh, just scrolling through the pages. All right. The first topic uh, that we discussed for the school year was the uh, laboratory equipment. And just like on the homework and the quizzes that you took, there will be pictures of different uh, types of laboratory equipment and you'll need to identify them. And let's, uh, the Quizlet I made intentionally for you to use to study. So make sure that you can identify all of these pictures. Um, I do want to look at a few that are the most easily missed. Uh, the um, watch glass uh, and the crucible um, evaporation disc. These are very easy to mix up. So let's go back. The watch glass is exactly what it looks like. All right, it, it's glass and you can see through it and you're, you put it on top of uh, beakers, evaporation uh, dishes, etc. that could splatter when they uh, heat up so that you can watch it but not uh, scar your face or your eyes at the same time. So if I were you, I would write down evaporation disc and let's make a list actually uh, if you would like to grab a piece of paper pause the video um, and a pen or open up a tab where you can take notes but these will be on the test and they are the most uh, widely missed on the test so the watch glass uh, test tubes funnels stir uh, bars, pipettes, these are all things that you're really not going to confuse them with anything else, but the watch glass. And then, um, oops, this is a crucible. Okay. Uh, and the crucible compared to the watch glass, uh, the crucible has this little lid. All right. Um, and it's not made of glass, it's actually made of um, porcelain or another ceramic type of material. Uh, and the crucibles are used to heat up a substance very, very, to very high temperatures, as just as it says. And that's why they always have this lid so that uh, it doesn't um, splash out while it's being heated up. So put the crucible with lid on your list with the watch glass. Um, actually, you're not going to need to know that for the test. All right, so this is the mortar and pestle. Mortar and pestle. That goes on your list as well. The mortar and pestle looks, in a picture, it looks a lot like the crucible. Um, but the mortar and pestle, it doesn't have a lid. Uh, and it has that... Uh, the pestle, which is what is used to crush up uh, a solid into a powder. All right, so if we go back and look at, oops, see, look at the crucible. They're actually very different when you see them in person, um, but they are very, very easy to mix up because they, they look very similar. Um, so what you're looking for, if it has a lid, it's a crucible. If it has this, what kind of looks like a little baseball bat, that's the mortar and pestle. The evaporating dish also looks like the crucible, the watch glass, and the mortar and pestle. Unlike the watch glass, this is not made of glass and you can't see through it. Uh, it's not the crucible because it doesn't have a lid. It's not the mortar and pestle because it doesn't have that baseball bat looking pestle. 
So that's what you're looking for, even though they all look similar to each other. So since they do look sim similar to each other and they are used quite a bit in chemistry, um, you can pretty much guarantee that those will be on the test. Uh, this is a Bunsen burner. That's hard to confuse with anything. Let's see. Okay. Even though this looks odd, the name is exactly what it is. So wire gauze with ceramic center. So if you look at it, lo and behold, that's wire gauze. And even if you didn't know, didn't know that was ceramic, there is something in the center. So that's what you're looking for for this one. They really were not very creative with this name at all. Uh, let's see now. Okay, so the clay triangle. Once again, the person at work that day was the not very creative person. Uh, and then it's a triangle. And those little bars, which are meant to absorb the heat, because you use these uh, over a Bunsen burner, usually to hold something, usually a crucible. Um, it's made of clay and it's the shape of a triangle. So whoever named this said, hey, let's call it the clay triangle. And that, and that stood the test of time. So those aren't so hard because they are exactly what they look like. All right, now, other pieces of equipment that you will probably mix up. So let's make a second list. And this is called crucible tongs. Okay, we have several sets of tongs that we easy to confuse. The crucible tongs, you can pick those out of a crowd because they have here on the end, um, it almost looks like it's broken that somebody's bent it, but that's used to pick up the crucible lid. And then you pick up the crucible with this part that also looks like somebody has bent it again. So the crucible tongs have this characteristic um, angle bend in them, uh, which we're not gonna see on the other tongs uh, that we're gonna look at. Oops. All right, these are all easy. Okay, test tube holder, once again, uh, <laughs> whoever named those other boring ones probably named this as well, but some students do mix up the test tube holder and the crucible tongs and the beaker tongs. So the beaker tongs do look like the crucible tongs, but notice that the beaker tongs have this, usually have this rubber to help grip onto the beaker and they do not have that bend to pick up a lid, which we see on the crucible tongs. Here you go. So notice the difference. The beaker tongs, uh, this area is larger and it's flat uh, and it has the rubber where the crucible tongs have the bend because that picks up the lid and then you pick up the crucible right here. Uh, and then uh, the weighing boats. Uh, weighing boats are exactly what they sound like when you are um, measuring the mass of a solid or a powder, uh, then you would want a, okay, so they call them weighing dishes. Weighing dishes, weighing boats, um, same thing. And the volumetric flask. Uh, the volumetric flask almost look like a genie bottle. They're very cool looking. Uh, and they measure one volume uh, and one volume only. And they're used to make very precise and accurate um, measurements of a solution. So uh, if you're making a solution, so it's mixing two things together um, and you want to describe the concentration, in order for the concentration to be exactly what you say it is, 
uh, you will use one of these volumetric flasks. So we, uh, you will probably end up using one in your lifetime. Uh, this is a volumetric pipette. And the volumetric pipette has almost what looks like a bulb uh, in the middle of it, and they're glass. And this is also used to measure a very precise, usually not a solution. Usually it's one liquid, one pure liquid. It's not a solution. But you would use the volumetric uh, flasks to um, measure a solution. All right, so make sure you can identify all of those. All right, graphing review. These are the notes that we went over in class, and we've been graphing a fair amount in this class, so you probably, hopefully, know all this without really having to study it again. Um, what you need to know is how to, oops, sorry. Um, you need to know how to label a graph. Um, and because on the test it will be online, uh, what I'll most likely do is give you a picture of a graph that has mistakes on it, and then you'll have to make corrections. So what you're looking for uh, is to make sure uh, that uh, the graph is set up properly. And if you look, which we have used many, many, many times as you're, as you're being graded on the different graphs, we have this, um, I don't know why I keep doing that. You have this checklist of how I've been grading your graph. So if you're looking at a graph on the test and you need to say what's wrong with it, following uh, this checklist is the best idea. And that would include looking at the X and Y axis, making sure there's a scale, uh, making sure that the axes are labeled with units. Is there a title for the graph? Are the data points on the graph? Is there a best fit line? Um, does the Y axis have the dependent variable? Does the X axis have the independent variable? These are all things that uh, you need to be able to identify. Uh, you will also need to be able to uh, calculate the slope of a line. Uh, and you will need to, uh, as you did on the quiz, look at a best fit line with data points around it and then give suggestions of points that could be used to determine slope. And remember, the way you do that is you have to pick numbers on the best fit line. You don't use the data points to calculate slope unless the data point happens to fall on the best fit line, then you would. Uh, and that has been a question on uh, homework and on the quiz for this material. So go back and double check that you know how to calculate slope uh, and uh, that you know to calculate slope using the best fit line. All right, so the third topic was the metric conversions. So Remember that is converting between decimeters and centimeters and kilometers and all of that. Once again, I've made you a Quizlet and these will quiz you on knowing what the different prefixes stand for, all right? Uh, and then also uh, how to convert uh, from one to another, all right? So 
this is a good Quizlet, um, really that covers everything um, in terms of the unit conversions. And then, um, let's see. Oh no, oh no. Okay, and then these are actually are just some examples. Okay, here are the ones I was looking for. There are some of these that um, ask you some simple conversions uh, for you to do. Uh, and basically are practice uh, problems. So you have these practice problems uh, and then you can go back through the homeworks and um, make a new attempt at the homeworks and then uh, you can start from scratch and then grade yourself and see how you do and in the homework metric conversions part two in this homework i put instructions on how to do the conversions um, if you have if you need a refresher okay so it was in this homework that i actually had the information on how to convert between uh, the different prefixes so definitely take a look at that and once again a good way to study is just to do the homework again start a new attempt all right, sig figs. Uh, once again, I made a Quizlet for you. Uh, and it is a lot of practice problems. So uh, I would definitely go through these uh, to see if you get the answers correct. Um, because if you can do this Quizlet, then you're you're good. You are you know uh, sig figs. And then there are uh, homework questions and um, the classwork that we did. Uh, definitely go back through those. Uh, some important points to remember about sig figs are making measurements, especially using rulers. So remember that sig figs are numbers that either are the scale themselves, and then there is one more sig fig that's in between the scale markings and only one so for example this scale is every one centimeter so one centimeter centimeters in the ones place we know for sure because they're there they're marked okay so we know that's two centimeters because it's marked two centimeters in between two and three centimeters or three and four centimeters, we're allowed to estimate one more place. And that's still considered a significant figure. We just can't estimate any more than that. So for this piece of whatever that is, um, we know for sure it's one, two, we know for sure it's more than three centimeters and less than four centimeters. So we can estimate um, that this is 3.2 centimeters, okay? So 3.2. Uh, but um, using this centimeter, this uh, ruler, the scale is every 10 centimeters. So we know it's more than zero and less than 10. Uh, and in between zero and 10, are the ones places, one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. So we can estimate that. So we can estimate that this is like three and a half or three centimeters. And that's all we can do. Uh, and then 
this ruler, we have even we have an even smaller scale. So this has a scale marked at every 0.1 centimeter. So 0.1 centimeters we know for sure um, because it's marked. Now if we zoom in, it's easier to see that these longer markings are the ones place and then these smaller marks are the point ones place. So this is one, two, three centimeters, 3.1, 3.2. So somewhere between 3.2 and 3.3. .3. So we can estimate between there. So then we would say for sure it's bigger than 3.2 and for sure it's smaller than 3.3 .3. so we can estimate between 0.2 and 0.3 and it just looks a little bit more so we could say 3.22 centimeters here once again you can uh, go through and resubmit or the homework and check it yourself to see how you did in comparison and taking, making sure that you can uh, give the correct sig figs because look at this one. This one has a scale of every one centimeters and we can estimate in between the ones. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is seven centimeters, but it's exactly seven centimeters. We can estimate and you have to estimate. You have to estimate so you can't just say oh this is seven on the dot you would have to say this is 7.0 so 7.0 means it's on the seven okay and by having the 7.0 anyone who knows about measurements so our example has always been the architect if the architect gets this value of 7.0 he knows you used this type of um, ruler with this scale on it. And so if you said just seven and nothing else, then he would think you are using ruler A because ruler A, the measurement would be seven and nothing else. But there's a big difference between ruler A and ruler B. You have a much better idea of the size of this piece of wood with ruler B. So if the architect gets the value 7.0, he kind of has an idea of what you use to make the measurement. So he knows kind of, you know, how accurate that measurement is compared to ruler A. If you just said seven, he would think you used this ruler and then he might think, goodness gracious, there's a lot of room for error in there. Uh, so the number of sig figs is important. It, it, it says something about how sure you are about that value. All right. Uh, with the graduated cylinders, the most common mistake is to um, not measure at the bottom of the meniscus. So just remember, measure at the bottom of the meniscus. And the same rules apply. Figure out the scale. And then the estimated digit is in between the scale. Um, and then temperature, uh, same thing. Uh, it's, it's just like the others. Uh, you figure out the scale first, and then you can measure between the scale. Um, the triple beam balance, be careful of those. If they always have... The values here you know like this is 700 plus 20 plus 2.90 okay so if all else fails just write the numbers down that it's pointing to add those together uh, and then that is uh, the mass um, let's see all right so if you can do all of those, then you're in a good place.
All right, the next topic was scientific notation. Uh, scientific notation, uh, there's a homework and a, a Quizlet, and then you took a quiz on this. Uh, once again, if you can do the Quizlet, then you are good for the test. Uh, things to remember. When you are writing uh, scientific notation, this value here only has sig figs in it. Uh, so for this number here, all of these zeros, they're not significant figures. So notice they are not in this number, okay? Uh, this zero is not a sig fig, so when we look at the answer, notice that it's three, it's not 3.0. Then for this number, these zeros are not significant, so they're not going to be in our scientific notation. Notice that they are gone. And Okay, these zeros are not significant, so you will notice that they are not in the scientific notation. It doesn't matter how many of these zeros there are, they're not significant. So once again, they are not here. Okay, um, same thing for this one, 7.8. We don't have 7.800. Same here. Um, and these are just some um, uh, terms uh, for sig figs. And then if you go uh, back to the homework, once again, it's a good idea to just redo the homework. It doesn't count against you, and it's a good way to quiz yourself. So in the homework for the scientific notation is where I give the instructions for how to determine uh, how to write the scientific notation. Uh, remember to keep all uh, zeros that are significant. They um, will be in the answer, but not um, insignificant. Well, not insignificant. Placeholder zeros. All right. Now, dimensional analysis. We're only doing a little bit uh, of di dimensional analysis. And I have um, given you just some of the common mistakes for dimensional analysis. Usually it's uh, flipping the unit factor upside down. And uh, here is a video link for uh, a reminder of how to do dimensional analysis. And then uh, in the homework that, oops, the homework assignment is a good place uh, to study. And it's also a good place um, to study the quizzes. So in the homework, again, I have the instructions for how to set up dimensional analysis. And then once again, on the test, I'm, you won't have to set one up, but you will need to explain what's wrong with one. So they'll be set up incorrectly. And then you will have to say um, how to set them up correctly. And then last but not least, density. Uh, and then I added these class notes for you. Oops, there we go. Uh, and we went over all this in class. I just made these for you as a reminder. Uh, the main um, concept is that density is equal to mass divided by volume. So you could um, have to calculate density, uh, and then you would need to know what the mass was of the object and the volume. We did that with pennies. We did that with aluminum foil. We did that with the steel pellets, etc. So looking over your lab is helpful.
Um, and here are some um, equations for volume for regularly shaped objects you might need to use. And then remember, if it's an irregular shaped object, uh, you can't use those equations, but you can use the displacement method. So you measure the volume of a liquid, and then you add the substance into the graduate cylinder. And then um, the amount that the liquid rises when you put the object in the graduate cylinder is equal to the volume of that object. All right. I also made you a study guide that tells you the information that you need to study for the test. And it is a summary of everything that we just talked about. Um, and also some things you, you really, it's just not worth your time to use to study. Uh, so definitely take a look at this if nothing else. Of course, um, that would mean you probably weren't listening to this video. Uh, so um, if you've listened to this video, thank you. Uh, all right, so if you have any questions, just let me know.